Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Yes, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The purposes of his heart to all generations. Yeah, the plans of the heart belong to man. But the reply of the tongue is from the Lord. Because the Lord of hosts has purposed. And who can thwart him? His hand is outstretched. And who? can turn it back. Lord, I thank you for having your way. I pray that I would decrease so that you would increase. I pray for everyone who you've led to this teaching that you would anoint them from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet with a fresh and a new anointing, with a fresh and a new revelation, with new insight, new vision as you open up your Torah to teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. Open up our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. And Lord, may you always receive all the honor, glory, and praise because you are worthy. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the great I am. And to you, we look because only in you we have our help. Help us now, Lord God, as we study your word. In Jesus' name, the name above all names, we pray and ask it all. Amen. Well, thank you for coming back to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Open, Everything Will Change. And I started off with that reading from the book of Proverbs because I had a purpose in my own heart about doing this study. And I had a plan in my heart to have it go one way. But as the Proverbs said, you know, the counsel of the Lord is what is going to prevail. His purposes will always prevail no matter what we plan in our hearts. And so this teaching is the purpose that he had planned before the foundations of the world. And here I am as an obedient servant carrying out the task that he wants me to do because I had a totally different plan in my own heart. But Praise God that he's always instructing us, always teaching us, always encouraging us. Oh, what a good God he is. He's always encouraging us to go down that path that leads to life and not to seek our own will, but to submit unto his will in every way, every thought. Every deed, every action, submit everything to him. Trust not in thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct our paths. And I thank him because he's so wonderful. And this teaching is going to be about what God told me to do and this is about what is coming, and we need to come together right now and let us reason, hallelujah. Let us come right now together and let us reason, says the Lord. You see, uh, we have to come to him and we have to see what he has to say. No longer do we have to lean upon our own understanding. No longer do we lean upon our own wisdom. No longer do we think our own thoughts because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so far are his ways and his thoughts above our ways and our thoughts. Therefore, he says, come, let us reason together. 
And we're going to reason together through what thus says the Lord. You see, we're going to let the Bible speak for itself because we need teaching. Okay, there's so much false teaching out here that it's it'll make your stomach sick. Okay. Because people have their own ideas, they have their own agendas, they have their own devils and doctrines that they answer to. Doctrines of demons, okay? But when we stick to the book, hallelujah, when we stick to what thus says the Lord, we can't be wrong. We're not gonna, we're not gonna sit on the fence on this channel. We're going to cut it straight and we're going to walk down the narrow path because God in these last few moments of human history, he has made known unto his servants, the prophets, what he is going to do when the end of the age begins. This mystery that he's hidden in his word has now been revealed and we can go to what the bible says and with the understanding that he gives us through the power of the holy ghost you see may your faith not stand in the wisdom of men but may your faith stand in the power of the holy ghost you see May your faith not stand in the wisdom of men, but may your faith stand in the power of the Holy Ghost, you see. We have to have the Holy Spirit, my friends, and the Holy Spirit will be our guide under all truth. And so let us go into this word of God and let us reason together and let God speak for himself. So I pray for that fresh and new anointing to be upon you. And I pray that you'll have a teachable spirit. And I pray that the Lord will instruct you as you sit before his feet and seek that good thing. Hallelujah. You've, you were seeking that good thing because he's led you to this uh, table that he's prepared for us right now. And uh, you've Cast away all your cares. You're not being busy like Martha, but you're sitting down at his feet like Mary, and you're seeking after that good thing. Hallelujah. You're seeking after the word of God because you're hungry. Hallelujah. Yes, you're thirsty. Hallelujah. And God, he's given us a meal to eat. He's given us drink to drink. And he's given us a feast to feast at. Hallelujah. So pull up a plate, uh, tuck in your dining table uh, shirt, and pull up your seat to the table and let us dig in into the word of God. Hallelujah. And so we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God will be thoroughly, 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 thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, God has told us the end from the beginning. And because he's told us the end from the beginning, we can look into what the Bible says because all of Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And when Paul the Apostle was writing this letter to Timothy, you know, uh, there was no canonized Bible for the New Testament. He was speaking about uh, the Old Testament, okay? He was speaking in regards to the Old Testament, but even when the New Testament was canonized and all the writings were compiled together that were inspired to make up that New Testament that we hold in our hands, the 27 books that we have in our Protestant Bibles, that is also included in all scripture. Hallelujah. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so this is key because we go to what the Bible says. When we reason with the Lord, when he says, come, he says, come to the table. Sit down, son or daughter. Sit down at the table that I've prepared for you. He says, come, whoever you are. He says, come wherever you're from. He says, come and dine at the master's table because his food is 
good indeed. Hallelujah. And the food that he feeds us is food for our souls that will nourish us forever and ever. And so I say these things because I want to combat false teachers. I want to combat um, people who uh, speak from their own minds and their own thoughts and their own intuitions. And I, and I want to go against that because we're going to stick to what the Bible says, because when we stick to what the Bible says, we can't be wrong when the Holy Spirit is our teacher and he's guiding us and leading us into all truth. Hallelujah. And so uh, Paul in the book of Romans tells us, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. You see, whatever was written in former days, again, he's talking about the Tanakh. He's talking about the Old Testament, the 39 books that we have in the Old Testament. He's speaking about that. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Hallelujah. It was written for our instruction. Hallelujah. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. You see, come, my friends, whoever you are, if you're thirsty, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Hallelujah. You see, God satisfies us with wine and milk. Because that wine speaks of the joy of the Lord. The milk that he provides speaks of the nourishment for our souls as we continue to grow in the things of the Lord. And the bread that he tells us to come and eat speaks of the life that he gives unto everyone who is hungry and thirsty. And so we're going to go into what the scripture says to paint the picture about the end of days because the rapture is about to happen, my friends. And our hope is found in the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture. It's all found in what the Bible says. And because we go by what the Bible says, we could go to the beginning of the book we could go to the beginning of the Word of God and we could look in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and we can see that there's hope found in the tabernacle of Moses that confirms the pre-tribulation rapture. It confirms the pre-tribulation rapture. You see, God is not a man that he should lie. Hallelujah. You see, what God says in his Word, it's already done. Hallelujah. What God says in his word, it's already done. Hallelujah. And because it's already done, God has given us substance. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I'm feeling, oh, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, oh, oh, here we go. Hallelujah. I'm feeling ready to, to, to preach now. You see, because the Bible tells us that Faith, hallelujah, comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so uh, the writer to the Hebrews tells us that now faith is the substance of things hopeful, the evidence of things not seen. You see, God has given us substance, hallelujah. You see, Substance is what he says in his word. Substance is something that you can build upon. Substance is something that you can handle and feel and touch. Substance is evidence for what we place our hope in. You see, we may have hope in a million and one things, but if there's no faith in that hope, there's no substance. You see, faith is the substance. Hallelujah. That activates 
God's move in our lives. For without faith, no one can please God. For everyone who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of all those who diligently seek him. You see, our faith is based in evidence, evidence that God has given us in his word and in our individual lives when he came into our lives and made us into a new creation. You see, and because we're new creations in Christ, we now have the Holy Spirit residing in us who opens up the word of God to provide more and 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 more evidence, substance that we can build our faith upon. Hallelujah. And so the pre-tribulation rapture is a 100% guarantee. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. You see, be careful lest your sin find you out, God says. If you add to the word or if you take away from it, there's a curse that comes upon you. Okay, that's what the Bible says. We're going about what the Bible says. God don't mince words. Hallelujah. God, he don't mince words. Hallelujah. You see, we got to go by what the book says. And the book says we can't add to what he's already written and we can't take away from what he's already said. And therefore, we got to go to what the Bible says. What did he say in the word of God? What did he say in the Bible? Okay, because what he said in the Bible That's the only thing that matters. And so when we go to the Torah and we look in the tabernacle of Moses, we see where our hope is found. Our hope that Jesus Christ will come and get his body, the body of Christ, and he's going to take us to the Father's house and we're going to be protected from the seven-year time of tribulation. So if you already know these things and you already understand how the temple is going to be furnished in heaven. I pray that you'll continue to watch this video because uh, this is more evidence that you could continue to build upon your faith with and you could continue to share with others to tell others the guarantee of the pre-tribulation rapture because the time is short. It's all about to happen, and we got to be 100% right. We got to be watching and praying, looking for him, hastening unto the soon coming day of the Lord because it's all about to happen. And he says, watch and pray always so that you can be accounted worthy to escape all the things that are about to come on the earth and stand before the Son of Man. We're going to go by what the book says on this channel. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's get into this because this is very important. This is very important because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so in the Torah, in Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 5, it tells us how God commanded Moses to set up the earthly tabernacle. Okay, the earthly tabernacle was set up according to this fashion, according to Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and you shall put in it the ark of the testimony and you shall screen the ark with the veil and you shall bring in the table and arrange it and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps and you shall put the golden altar for instance before the ark of the testimony and set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. And so Here we see the model that God gave to Moses of how Moses was to set everything up exactly how God had revealed it to him on Mount Sinai. And so because everything that was written beforehand was written for us And for our learning and because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and because God tells us the end from the beginning and because God says that these were types and shadows and a model of good things to come. But the substance is Christ. When the true tabernacle in heaven is open. The same way that the earthly tabernacle was furnished 
with the table of showbread and the menorah lamp is going to be the same way that the heavenly tabernacle will be furnished on the day when Jesus Christ comes on the clouds of heaven. So let's continue to walk with this teaching. Help us, Holy Ghost. So when the temple in heaven opens, the heavenly tabernacle will be furnished just as the earthly tabernacle was. For the earthly tabernacle served as a model for the true one in heaven. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 tells us this, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. You see, we learn by repetition. Therefore, we have to repeat ourselves because God repeated himself in his word. And because we're not greater than the master, we have to do just as he does. And so we have to repeat things because we learn by repetition. We learn by continuing to go into what the Bible says, to see what God says. And therefore we come and we reason together. Hallelujah. And we see what thus saith the Lord. And we learn and we learn and we learn and we learn when we study, when we study, when we study, when we study what thus saith the Lord. And so the model of the earthly tabernacle tells us exactly how the heavenly tabernacle will be furnished on the day when Jesus Christ comes to get us. Hallelujah. And so we see the diagram of uh, the tabernacle, the floor plan of the tabernacle, and it declares unto us the way, the truth, and the life, as John chapter 14, verse 6 tells us. Jesus Christ is the way. He was the one who came to this earth, and he died on the altar, that cross where he gave up his life. He laid down his life willingly. He said no one had the power to take his life, but he said he laid down his life willingly because he had the power to take it up again. And so the way is this altar of burnt sacrifice. This is what Jesus Christ represents. He is the way. And then once uh, we come to the way, he's also uh, the truth. He's the way, the truth, and uh, the truth is this laver where the priests had to wash. And once they made a sacrifice or if they were going into uh, the very uh, holy place to offer up uh, the incense or to light the menorah lamp or to replace the uh, bread on the table of showbread, they had to wash. And so Jesus Christ says that uh, we are to be sanctified with his truth, for his word is truth, and he washes us with the water of the word. And so uh, the truth is Jesus Christ, and because Jesus Christ is the word of God, we have to be washed by him. Hallelujah. So Jesus said he's the way, he's our sacrifice, he's the truth, he's the one who washes us with his truth, and he is the life. Hallelujah. Because uh, once he got up on that third day, he rose with all power. Hallelujah. And he uh, lives forever. Hallelujah. He's um, after the order of Melchizedek and uh, he's made uh, higher than uh, the highest heavens. He's entered into uh, the very holy of holies because he's God in the flesh. And he presented his very own precious blood before the father and uh, his life that he gives unto all who come to him by faith is eternal life. And because he gives us eternal life, he says, where I am, there you can be also if you come his way. If you go the only way, there's only one way. As you can see this arrow, there's only one way. There isn't no other way into the tabernacle precincts, okay? Uh, there's no other way except going through the curtain, this one door that entered into the tabernacle. There's no other way. Jesus Christ is the only way. God in the flesh, born of a virgin, died a substitutionary death for all the sins of the world, rose on the third day, and is coming back with great power and glory. 
You got to believe in him. He's the only way. You can't believe in Sun Young Moon. You can't believe in Jehovah Witnesses. You can't believe in Mormons. You can't believe in Buddha. You can't believe in Allah. You can't believe in Darwin. You can't believe in Scientology. You can't believe in atheism. You can't believe in any of these other isms, Hinduisms. All these other isms under the sun is going to lead you to the lake of fire. There's only one way, my friends. And that one way has a process, an order. Let everything be done decently and in order. We got to do it God's way. And God's way is the way. Die on that altar. The truth. Wash in his word. Renew your mind day after day through the washing of his word. And then on the cloudy and dark day, we're going to enter into the life, which is in the father's house. And Jesus said in the uh, book of Psalms, chapter 16, verse 11, you will show me the path of life. Hallelujah. The path of life is this one narrow road that few people find, but that life has one destination and that destination is right in here. The father's house, because in his presence is fullness of joy. What is what is what is that, my friends? We haven't even well, we've had a glimpse. We've had a glimpse because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Hallelujah. But we haven't entered into his presence. Oh, we haven't seen him face to face. Not yet. Oh, but soon and very soon we will see him face to face just as he is. Hallelujah. And God says in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. You see, our God is a good God. And this is what God says. This is his promise, my friends. And the question is, do you believe what God says? Okay. Allah ain't never promised me none of this. Buddha ain't never promised me none of this. Atheism and evolution ain't never promised me none of this. But God, hallelujah, God himself promised me and everyone who loves him this, that we would enter into his presence as we go down the path of life. You see, he shows us the path of life. It's up to us if we want to walk on it. He sets before every one of us life and death. There's two paths. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You see, there's two paths. Hallelujah. You see. And he shows us the path of life. Hallelujah. And he says, come whosoever will. But you see, we have a choice. We got free will. We don't have to go through this door. We can go any other way. There's a, a billion other directions to go. Look at all around here. OK, but there's only one arrow. There's only one way. There's only one door. If you want to go down the path of life. <laughs> oh, but if you want that wide gate. <laughs> If you want that broad road, my goodness. Oh, there's plenty of other options out there. You can listen to every sly and cunning voice and all those devilish devices. For there are many who have gone out into the world saying, I am the Christ. Oh, you see, but for those who have walked on the path of life, because God has ordained us to be on that path before the foundations of the world. He gave us a warning. He said, be not deceived. That was the first thing he said in Matthew 24. Be not deceived. Hallelujah. Help us, Holy Ghost. Because we are your sheep and because we are your sheep, we only hear your voice. And because you have shown us the path of life, continue to lead us as the good shepherd down the path of life. Because we choose you. Because you first chose us. Oh, how he loves us. Good God almighty, how he loves us. Hallelujah. Oh, he's a good God, my friends. Oh, he's a good God. Oh, he's a good God. Let everyone ha that have breath praise the Lord. Let the redeemed 
of the Lord say so. Oh, have you been forgiven much today, my friends? You see, I get riled up when I start talking about the goodness of the Lord. I get riled up when I start talking about Jesus, the captain of my salvation, the anchor of my soul, the lover of me. I mean, he loved me when I didn't even love myself, my friends. He loved you even when we didn't love him. Oh, how he loves us. Even while we were yet sinners. He died, my friends. He died on that cross for you and me. Even when we were lost and without hope and without God in the world, he died. For you and me. Oh, I I, I just, uh, let me go on. Oh, Holy Spirit, help me. Sometimes you just can't go on because you got to talk about him. You got to praise his name. You got to give him glory. You got to give him praise. You got to declare his works day after day, night after night, moment after moment, because he is worthy. He will keep us in perfect peace. Whose mind. It stayed on him. Let me keep on going because we just getting started and I got to get this teaching over with. Uh, but help us, Holy Ghost. Help us, Holy Spirit. OK, so we see the model. OK, we're going somewhere. You see, we're going into the father's house. When this temple door opens, we're going in. And I want to show you how the temple that was set up on the earth, according to the pattern that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, will be the same way that the temple in heaven will be furnished when it opens on the cloudy and dark day. Uh, so let's go, Holy Ghost. Uh, when the temple in heaven opens, the rapture occurs. So here we see the curtain. This represents the door to the Father's house, and there goes the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, I know people, I know I know that there's other renditions of how the Ark of the Covenant may look. I'm not, this is, you know, <laughs> just a picture. I'm just trying to convey a simple message. I'm not trying to get into the details, even though the details are important. But just follow the teaching. Hallelujah. So when the temple in heaven opens, the rapture occurs. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19 tells us this. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Okay, so we know that when the temple of God is opened in heaven, the first thing that will be seen in the temple is the ark of his testament. And that's the throne of God. When we read about the temple in heaven opening in Revelation chapter 4, when John says that he was caught up in the spirit and he went through that open door when the voice told him to come up here and I will show you things which must happen after this. When he went through that open door, the first thing that John said that he saw was a throne. The first thing that John said that he saw was a throne. And the throne is the ark of his testament. OK, so uh, let's keep on going. So. We can see what the Bible says for the Bible tells us that in the book of Revelation, there are three of the temple furnishings, which are mentioned by name in the book of Revelation. OK, the three of the four temple furnishings that are mentioned by name in the book of Revelation is the ark, the menorah and the golden altar of incense. OK. So three of the four are mentioned by name in the book of Revelation. The ark in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. The menorah, Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. OK, so uh, that's the menorah, the seven spirits of God. That's the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
uh, eternally uh, represented by the menorah lamp that stood on the earth, which provided the light for uh, the tabernacle. And because the Holy Spirit is the light of the world, because he's in all born again believers, here he is in his fullness right before the throne, because he's God too, okay? He's God himself, okay? The triune nature of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three are one. They're ekad, okay? Now, there's not three gods. There's only one God, okay? And they're a triunity of beings, just like us. We are triune people. We have body, soul, and spirit, but there's not three of us. There's only one of us, but we're made up of three different parts, and our body's not our soul, our soul's not our spirit, but yet all three parts make us who we are, just like God, the Godhead. The Father's not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, but all three are one. Hallelujah. It's all, they are all one, and we see all three of them throughout uh, the whole Bible, the triune nature of God, always working together. Hallelujah. Because there's no division in the Godhead. Okay, so uh, we see the ark and then the menorah and then the golden altar of incense is mentioned in Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 through 5. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. OK, so as you can see, I put the the colors of each of the three um, of each of the three. um the lightnings, the thunderings, and the voices, okay? These three things that always occur when the temple is open. And the lightnings, the thunderings, and the voices are connected to the three items of uh, the tabernacle, okay? The ark, lightnings, voices, thunderings. The menorah, lightnings, thunderings, voices. The golden altar of incense, uh, voices, thunderings, lightning, okay? And as you can see... Um, the the lightnings, the voices, and the thunderings proceed from the throne of God, and the throne of God is always mentioned in connection with the lightnings, voices, and thunderings, okay? When the ark is mentioned, uh, the lightnings and the voices and the thunderings are said to come. When the menorah is mentioned, the first thing it says is, out of the throne proceeded lightning, thunderings, and voices, and then the menorah, the seven Lamps of fire are burning before the throne, which are, which are the seven spirits of God. And then the golden altar of incense, uh, when uh, the angel does his service at the altar of incense to offer up the prayers of all the saints, uh, the smoke of the incense ascends up out of the angel's hand before the throne of God. Okay? Okay? And so the throne of God is always emphasized with the voices, the thunderings, and the lightnings, because that is from where the lightning, the thunderings, and the voices come from. So you see the connection, okay? God is putting the picture together by letting us know that the thunders, the lightnings, and the voices are all connected to the temple furnishings. Well, three of them, the ark, the menorah, and the golden altar of incense. So let's go to the next slide. So we can build the picture. When the rapture happens, this is going to be the order of events. When the rapture happens, the temple doors are going to open. When the temple doors are open, the body of Christ will appear in heaven. Then when the body of Christ appears in heaven, the throne will be seen. And when the throne is seen, there's going to be lightnings, thunders, and voices that are going to proceed from the throne. And then the temple is going to fill with smoke. And then the doors to the temple are going to be shut. And then for those who are left behind on the planet, on the earth, hailstones and coals of fire will rain down on the planet. And the greatest earthquake in human history will occur. And then nine, 
the number of judgment, Jacob's trouble will begin. Okay, and so we see this in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 15, verses 5 through 8, and Revelation chapter 16, verses 18 through 21. Look at how it reads, it, because this, these two scriptures go together along with the three scriptures that we read earlier with the last slide when it mentioned the three articles of the temple, the ark, the menorah, and the golden altar of incense. So let's read Revelation chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And when that happens, that's when the rapture occurs. Verse 6, And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So once uh, the temple is open in verse five, that's when the rapture happens. And so when the temple is open and the rapture happens, um, if we jump down to Revelation chapter 16, starting at verse 18 through 21, uh, this is what's going to happen once that door opens to the Father's house. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. Okay, remember remember how we read on the last slide, the voices and the thunders and the lightnings all proceed from the throne of God, right? And so here we see the same three events, the voices, the thunderings, and lightnings coming from Revelation chapter 16, verse 18. And then the next thing that we see is that there's a great earthquake. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So we can read all these scriptures, Revelation chapter 15, verses 5 through 8, and Revelation chapter 16, uh, 18 through 21, in conjunction with um, what we read with the last slide. Uh, this last slide where we saw the lightnings and the voices and the thunderings occurring when the ark and the menorah and the golden altar of incense are all mentioned because it's all connected. Whenever you read the lightnings, the voices and the thunderings, it's all the same event. It's all the same event. It's all the same event. But John is telling us from a different perspective what's happening. But it's the same event. It's the cloudy day event. It's the day of the rapture, the day when the temple in heaven is open, the day when Jesus Christ comes on the clouds, the day when the heavens and the earth shake, the day when everything begins. It's the day of sudden destruction for those who are left behind on the planet. Because if you're left behind on the planet, there's going to be the greatest earthquake in human history that occurs. And there's going to be the greatest hailstorm in human history that occurs. Okay. Earthquake and a great hail are going to occur for everyone who's left behind on the planet. But for those who are caught up into the father's house, because the door has been opened, we are going to be protected and we are not going to feel the effects of the earthquake and the great hail. That is why when you read Revelation chapter four, which is the perspective of the church, because John goes through the open door and he's part of the body of Christ. So Revelation chapter four represents the perspective that the church will have of the cloudy day, because when the church goes through the open door, there's not going to be an earthquake and there's not going to be great hail falling upon the church. That is why when you read Revelation chapter 4, you don't see the mention of the earthquake and the great hail. 
because that's the perspective of the church. We're going to go and be protected from all of the destruction that comes upon the planet at the same time. Okay. But we could connect the whole event of the cloudy and dark day by looking from the different angles that John is telling us the revelation from. And what links the event of the cloudy day is the lightnings, the voices, and the thunderings. Okay. The lightnings, the thunderings, and the voices all are connected to when the temple is open and when it's going to be furnished. Okay. And so I pray that that's clear because there's still more. Okay. Because remember, there's four items. There's four items in the tabernacle. Okay. And so we went over three of the items, but what about the table of showbread? Remember, let me go back to the slide. Okay. So here goes the model. There's the ark. There's the altar of incense. There's the menorah. And so we mentioned all three of these because they're all mentioned by name in the book of Revelation. But the table of showbread, which is right here, was never mentioned. Why? Why was the table of showbread never mentioned? Because the table of showbread has to go inside the temple when it opens. Okay, it has to go inside. And as a matter of fact, the table of showbread is what first goes inside. When the temple is set up, according to what Moses was told in Exodus chapter 40, Exodus chapter 40, uh, verse three tells us this. And you shall put in it the ark of the testimony and you shall screen the ark with the veil. So that's the ark of the covenant. That's this right here. And so verse four tells us this. And you shall bring in the table and arrange it. OK, so the table is is the table of showbread, and you're supposed to arrange it with the 12 loaves. And so that's the first item that goes in right after the ark is put in. But because um, this table of showbread is connected with the menorah, we see that there's an and connected to the setting up of the table of showbread. So verse four, let me read it all together. And you shall bring in the table and arrange it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. Okay, so the table of showbread and the menorah are connected. Okay, the table of showbread and the menorah is connected. And the table of showbread actually goes in before the menorah goes in. Okay, in accordance with how the earthly tabernacle was set up. So, we went over all these different items. We went over three of the different temple furnishings, which are mentioned by name in the book of Revelation. But the table of showbread was never mentioned. It's the only item of the temple not mentioned by name in the book of Revelation. So what about the table of showbread? Well, the Bible tells us the 144,000 is the table of showbread. Okay. The 144,000 is the table of showbread. The 144,000 is mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14. Okay, so on the table of showbread in the Old Testament, there were 12 loaves that were to be placed on the table of showbread. And the 12 loaves represented the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. It was called the bread of the presence, which was to be set before the face of the Lord at all times in the tabernacle, replaced every Shabbat by 12 new loaves. OK, and so one loaf equals one tribe. And so because there were 12 loaves, it equaled the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. And so the fulfillment of the table of showbread when the temple in heaven is furnished will be the 144,000, okay? That mysterious 144,000 that people have always come up with all these theories about who they are, but it's never been rooted in Scripture. There's not going to be 144,000 Jewish witnesses. It's not going to happen. If people understood the terribleness of the, of the dark and cloudy day, they would understand 
because the Bible tells us that it's only going to be the two witnesses who are going to be given power, supernatural power to preach for the first half of the tribulation. And God makes them indestructible. Okay, he makes the two witnesses indestructible. He points them out in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Okay, there's no debate about that. They're mentioned in Zechariah, the prophet, and then they're mentioned, of course, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. The two witnesses are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of all the earth. They're going to be the only two people who are going to be able to do anything for the Lord Jesus Christ without dying at least for the first three and a half years in during the time of Jacob's trouble. Because remember, the time of Jacob's trouble is darkness. It's a day of gloom, okay? It's a day when no one can work out of the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. He says when he goes out of the world, the light goes out. When the restrainer is removed, when the body of Christ is taken out of the way, the Antichrist is revealed and it's darkness on the earth. Darkness, which is unimaginable. And God gives supernatural power to the two witnesses and they're able to do whatever they want for the first three and a half years. And God specifically says, because there's going to be people to try to hurt them. He says, if anyone tries to hurt them, they're going to be devoured by fire. He makes them fire breathing prophets. And I take that literally, man. It's the end of the age. My goodness. It's the last stand of these 6,000 years for the enemy, okay? It's the end of the road, my friends. <laughs> the Bible says affliction will not rise up a second time. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, my friends. It's the end of the age, my friends, and God, he has a work to do during the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? And he tells us exactly how he's going to accomplish it in his word. And for the first three and a half years, he has the two witnesses, okay? I'm not going to get into who they are, Enoch and Elijah, Moses and Elijah, that's irrelevant to me. OK, the uh, not the identity of their names is not important to me. It's just knowing what God is going to do. OK, and it's not going to happen through the hundred and forty four thousand. They're not on the earth. OK, the hundred and forty four thousand are the table of showbread. They're going to be the memorial stones for the greatest event in human history next to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the great crossing over of redeemed man into the promised land, into the city made by God himself in new glorified bodies when man will put on immortality. God is going to memorialize the event and the memorialization of the event is the 144,000, the table of showbread, the 144,000 follow the lamb wherever he goes. And because the 144,000 follow the lamb wherever he goes, they are the bread of the presence. Hallelujah. They are the memorial stones for the greatest event in human history next to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is supported by Scripture. When Moses set up 12 pillars before God told him, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders to come up Mount Sinai and share a meal with God. Moses set up 12 pillars to memorialize the event. There has to be a memorialization when man encounters God on such a grand scale. Okay? And this is the forever and ever and ever memorialization of the event with the 144,000. Likewise, when the children of Israel crossed over into the promised land, Joshua was commanded to set up 12 stones, 12 memorial stones on the west side of the Jordan to commemorate the crossing over into the promised land. So that when 
the children of Israel would come and see those 12 stones. They would ask their fathers, what did it mean? Well, it was a testament forever that God was faithful to his promise and he crossed the children of Israel over into the promised land on dry land, just like he said he would do. God said that he has prepared a place for us in the Father's house so that where he is, there we will be also. God is going to use the 144,000 as a testament forever, as a memorialization of the greatest event in human history next to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The 144,000 is the table of showbread. It's confirmed by the scriptures, okay? And so one loaf for one tribe in the Old Testament equals 12,000 from one tribe in the New Testament. And because there were 12 loaves for the 12 tribes of the children of Israel in the Old Testament, there's going to be 144,000 from 12 tribes of the children of Israel in the New Testament. The 12 loaves that were on the table of showbread are multiplied by 12,000 each, which equals 144,000. The 144,000 is the table of showbread. Okay? It's the table of showbread. Okay? Because the proof is in the Bible. Hallelujah. <laughs> the proof is in the Bible. And so we go to Revelation chapter 7 to see the table of showbread and the menorah. In chapters uh, 7 of Revelation, we see in verses 4 through 8, we see uh, the 12,000 sealed from each of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Okay, so that's the table of showbread. And then right after the table of showbread is mentioned, 12,000 from each of the uh, 12 tribes of the children of Israel, right after that, who's mentioned? The great multitude, which is the menorah, a.k.a. the church, the seven churches. OK, there are seven branches to the menorah. There are seven spirits of God. OK, and so the seven spirits of God make up the seven churches of Revelation and uh, the Holy Spirit indwells each and every born again believer. And so we come from every nation, every kindred, every people and every tongue. And this great multitude is the menorah. This great multitude is the body of Christ. We always appear with the table of showbread. The table of showbread appears first, and then the menorah appears right after them, just like the order that Moses was given. Okay, we're not going outside with our own thinking. We're sticking to the book. Okay, we're sticking to what the Bible says because the Bible will not contradict itself. God means what he says and he says what he means. Verse 4, Exodus chapter 40, and you shall bring in the table and arrange it, the table of showbread, and you shall bring in the lamp stand and set up its lamp. Okay, so the table of showbread appears first, and right with it, the menorah lamp is put in. They go in together. It's the same order that we see in Revelation because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The table of showbread mentioned first, Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. The menorah lamp mentioned next, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. And because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter is established, God repeats himself again in Revelation chapter 14. Here we see the 144,000 mentioned first. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 14, and look where the 144,000 are. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Okay, so there goes the table of showbread and they're in heaven because Mount Zion is, is in heaven. And then verse two, here goes the menorah lamp. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. That's Revelation chapter 14, verse two. And so we know that this 
verse 2, we know that this is the great multitude, the menorah, the, the body of Christ, because Revelation chapter 19 identifies the voice from heaven of many waters. And so Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 8 tells us this. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. Okay, so that connects us way back to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And so uh, let me keep on reading. And as the voice of many waters, so we got the many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And who are these people? What are they rejoicing after? Verse 7 tells us, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So we see that Revelation 19 identifies that this voice is a voice of a great multitude, and it's and they have a voice of many waters. The many waters are right here in Revelation chapter 14, verse 2, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 2 tells us, and as the voice of great thunder, uh, mighty thunderings, okay, and they're uh, crying, uh, rejoicing, hallelujah, okay, because uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, the marriage of the Lamb has come, and then these, this great multitude of people, they're given fine linen, okay, they're given fine linen, clean and white, which is the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, it's the same attire that we see in Revelation chapter 7 of the great multitude, okay, Revelation chapter 7 uh, tells us here, verse 9, and after this, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Okay, so they have the white robes on. Okay, the white robes are given to them. Okay, the white robes are given to them because they've come out of the great tribulation, okay, because they were never part of the great tribulation, okay? They have no part in the great tribulation because they're being married to the Lamb. This is the body of Christ. This is me and you. This is the menorah lamp before the throne, okay? The great multitude is the seven branch menorah, the seven churches of Revelation made up from of people from every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue. We all appear together all at the same time, all in the Father's house because the rapture has come. We have crossed over. We have entered into the third heaven in new bodies because God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, has rescued us from the time of trouble. Hallelujah. So, I pray that this teaching was clear. I pray that this teaching was edifying. And I pray that you will also be in the Father's house when this event happens. As you can see, we didn't go to any other sources except for the Bible, and we let the Bible speak for itself. We just have to let the Bible speak for itself and let the Holy Spirit teach us, and we just can't go wrong. Okay, we can't go wrong if we let God tell us what he says in his word. Okay, and I just get passionate because I want God. Uh, we can't do anything uh, against the truth, but only for the truth. Okay, the truth of God endures forever. The word of God lasts forever. Okay, our bodies are perishing, but the word of God will never perish. The word of God endures forever. And so let us be valiant for the truth. Let us stand upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be God, my friends, because he's going to be God without your permission anyways. He's God all by himself. Let's get on his train. Let's get on his caboose. Let's ride on him until the kingdom comes forever and ever. Hallelujah. Because if you ain't riding on him, the Bible says when he comes, he's going to crush you. 
And when he crushes you, the Bible says you will be ground to powder. But if we fall on him, if we ride him, if we come to him, we're broken. And he lifts us up. Oh, we're broken. Hallelujah. But he makes us whole. Oh, we're broken, but he cleanses us. Oh, we're broken when he comes and meets us. Because we said yes. And then we become new creations. New creations in him. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He is the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. If you don't know him, this is what you got to do. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. Believe in your heart that he has risen from the dead and you shall be saved. Cry out to him and say, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. And he'll save you, my friends. He'll save you because there's power in the blood. Oh, yes, there's power in the blood. Good God Almighty, there's power in the blood. The only question is, do you know for surely he comes quickly? Uh, Maranatha. Amen.